The hoplite refers to the soldier of the classical Greek era of about 500 BC. The hoplite was a citizen soldier, meaning that he was not a full-time professional soldier, but something more like a modern militia, someone who would go to war when required. The armor and weapons of the hoplite soldier are among the most iconic styles in all history. The Corinthian style helmet, for example, is an icon used by sports teams around the world. And the bronze breast and backplate sculpted to a muscular male form is universally associated with heroism and epitomizes the warrior mystique. Although there were variations in the hoplite's armor and weapons, in this video we will focus on the versions shown here. Corinthian style helmet, bronze muscle cuirass, bronze greaves, a shield, a spear, and a sword. Firstly, the style of warfare the hoplites typically engaged in is called a phallax. A phallax consists of rows of soldiers standing side by side and several rows deep, usually about eight to 10 rows deep. This was shield and spear combat. Each soldier's shield protected both himself and the soldier to his left. The shield wall created a barricade behind which the soldiers were provided protection from enemy weapons. They were then able to use their spears to thrust into the opposing foe. This was a highly effective tactic on level ground and the Greeks used it with great success for several centuries. Future cultures would also utilize and adapt the phallax. The Romans are a very obvious example of this. A large shield is fundamental for an effective phallax and the classical Greeks had such a shield. It was called an aspis. It's also sometimes called a hoplon. That's actually where the word hoplite comes from. Generally, this was a round shield of about 32 to 38 inches in diameter. It was domed in the center with a flattened rim. It was constructed of layered wood and it was often then covered with oxide and had a bronze rim. Some aspices, aspi, aspices, I'm not sure. Some aspices were completely covered with bronze. The shield was strapped to the forearm with a handle for the hand. This allowed great mobility while keeping it close to the body. An interesting form and function element of this style is that the inner dome rested nicely on the shoulder. This greatly reduced arm fatigue. So for a shield to be effective, it must be sturdy enough to stand up to the abuse, but it also must be light enough that it can be wielded effectively for extended periods of time. This principle of strength versus weight is an age old dichotomy for shields and as well for all other armor and weapons for that matter, right up until modern era. So optimizing form and function, the aspis needed to be sturdy, as sturdy as possible, but weigh no more than say about 18 pounds. Now the shield protected the hoplite from about the chin level to just above the knees. To protect the two exposed areas that were left, that was the job of the helmet and the greaves. Let's take a look at the helmet first. The type of helmet shown here is generally called a Corinthian helmet as this style is well documented in and around the city-state of Corinth. It evolved from earlier helmets of a more simple open face design these earlier helmets were typically two or three, or sometimes more, plates of bronze that were riveted together. By this point in the classical era, which about 500 BC, remember, they had evolved into a full-faced helmet forged from a single piece of bronze. The cheek plates on some later period helmets became quite long and extended down to cover the neck, almost touching the breastplate. Helmets were typically lined with felt padding for further comfort and protection. The helmet shown here has a floating leather harness. And this was something that was used in some later Roman type helmets um, and also in modern hard hats. I don't believe any example of this type of inner harness have ever been found on a Greek helmet, but it uh, works well for this recreation. The helmet was also often provided with a crest holder. Crests were often made of horsehair as shown here, but they were sometimes also made with feathers or other materials. Now the greaves are a type of plate armor that protected the shins of the warrior. Basically a sheet of bronze that had been hammered into shape that conformed to the front of the warrior's legs. These, like the helmets, were often padded for extra protection and to reduce chafing. Felt or sometimes sea sponge were used to create this padding. The last main piece of armor worn by the hoplite was the cuirass, which protected the torso. The cuirass could be a few different designs. One design was the linothorax, which was composed of many layers of linen sewn together. This was a highly effective type of armor that is relatively cheap to manufacture and relatively comfortable in different weather conditions. Another type of cuirass consists of plates of bronze. By this period in history, they were close fitting and consisted of a breastplate and a backplate. 
The version shown here is the Muscle Cuirass, which, as the name implies, is sculpted in the likeness of a muscular male torso. When properly fitted, it is surprisingly mobile and very durable. Aesthetically, this is a formidable style of Cuirass, and no doubt it was somewhat intimidating to see a host of jack warriors bearing down on you. All right, let's talk about weapons. So as I previously stated, the spear was the primary weapon of the hoplite soldier. The hoplite spear was called a dory and typically had an iron spearhead on one end of a flexible wooden shaft. On the other end was a bronze butt spike. This butt spike helped balance the spear, but it also provided a secondary weapon for dispatching fallen foes. The butt spike was nicknamed a Sarator, which translates into Lizard Killer. The Sarator also made it possible to stick the dory into the ground at easy reach when not in use. The use of both bronze and iron in this single weapon is a good example of the blurry line dividing the Bronze Age from the Iron Age. There are rarely, if ever, sharp divides for the various ages we have given history. Classical Greece of the Hoplite Warrior was already several centuries deep into the Iron Age, but his kit consisted of more bronze than iron. The shift from bronze to iron was gradual and involved many variables, things like material availability, cultural biases, local technologies, and other factors. This made for a very complex web of gradients and lots and lots of gray area. Incidentally, the dory ranged in length from about 8 feet up to about 14 feet. The longer spears would be used by hoplites deeper in a phallax formation. The other weapon carried by the hoplite was his sword. Now, despite our modern society's obsessive fixation on the sword as a warrior's ultimate weapon, to the hoplite it was considered a secondary sidearm. This meant that the sword was only drawn and used after the phallax formation broke down and the spear became less practical in close quarters. There are a few different type of sword designs used by the hoplite. The one featured here is called the Xiphos, or Xiphos, I'm never sure of the pronunciation. It was an iron sword whose shape evolved directly from its earlier bronze forebearers. The leaf-shaped blade placed extra weight near the tip, enhancing its percussive force. Primarily a slashing weapon, it did, however, have enough of a point to allow for thrusting. As I mentioned, this sword was forged from iron, containing little or no carbon. Now, it's beyond the scope of this video to get into a discussion about metallurgy, but in very simplistic terms, iron combined with a small amount of carbon forms an alloy known as steel. With sufficient carbon content, steel can be heat treated to greatly enhance its hardness and toughness. So it needs to be realized that in this early Iron Age culture of classical Greece, tools and weapons of iron did not perform to the standards of modern heat treated tool seals. In short, iron weapons would bend and they would not hold an edge very well. Still, a sharp sword in skilled hands was a very formidable weapon. All right, let's just quickly mention pterogies. Pterogies were strips of linen or leather which protruded from the bottom of the cuirass and formed a type of skirt. This skirt provided some level of protection to the hips and thighs while still providing good mobility. Most commonly, these strips were made of layered linen and were basically just the bottom of the lenothorax, which is the linen cuirass, um, just strips that would extend down and become the skirt part of that. The pterogies featured here in this video are leather with bronze end pieces. They are a stylized interpretation and should not be considered historically accurate. Lastly, I'll mention footwear. The hoplites wore either a form of boot or, as depicted here, an open-toed sandal. Because of the organic composition and harsh lifestyle of any type of footwear, very few archaeological examples have survived to modern times. Hence, we're only left with descriptions and artistic depictions of things like footwear. So the sandals here were styled loosely after depictions seen on vases from the classical period. Well, there you go. Quick overview of the hoplites' armor and weapons, well, at least from the information I've been able to gather. I'm certainly not a trained historian, and I would welcome any feedback about the info I've presented here. If you enjoyed viewing this outfit, you might be interested in checking out our channel and watching the video series featuring the making of each component. Well, that's it for now. Please hit the like button. Please subscribe. Give us a thumbs up. All that stuff. Uh, this is Thack from Thack Ironworks. And I am saying, see ya!